Hello, good morning. My name is Milan Nitsch. I am the head of program for Central and Eastern Europe and Russia at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, also known as DGAP. Thank you very much for joining us for this online discussion with our distinguished speakers, whom I'm going to introduce to you in a moment. We have about 60 minutes to discuss elections in Russia's regions, which will be a major test for President Putin's political machine ahead of next year's parliamentary elections. These elections are taking place in the shadow of shocking assassination attempt on Alexei Navalny, leading opposition activist in Russia, that, which took place three weeks ago. Alexei is still recovering from severe poisoning in the hospital in Berlin, a few kilometers from the place uh, where I'm sitting now. Already starting tomorrow on September 11, due to the new rules on the early voting in Russia, but the so-called single voting day on Sunday will uh, decide uh, the, in 23 out of 85 regions of the Russian Federation, the voters will elect their governors, regional or local assemblies. Also, four regions will hold by-elections to state Duma. Um, we want to share a map. Um, with you to visualize the geography of these elections um, in Russia's regions. A stagnant economy and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic have helped uh, inflame public anger sparked by specific local issues where voters feel abandoned by President Putin's party, United Russia, whose popularity fell to a record low recently and sparked a series of huge protests in some places, most notably in Khabarovsk in the Far East. Elections will also take place in the city of Tomsk in Siberia. That's the city where Alexei Navalny visited and was poisoned before boarding a plane. While Russian doctors did not find any signs of poisoning, the German government announced a few days ago that Navalny was poisoned by the military-grade chemical nerve agent Novichok. Since then, the German-Russian relations have become even more tense. Calls for sanctions against Russia and especially for a pause or stop of the Nord Stream 2 projects are getting louder and put pressure on the German government, not only to warn, but also to sanction the Kremlin for the assassination attempt on Navalny. With me, these and other topics uh, will be discussed by our distinguished speakers, Vladimir Milov, advisor to Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. Good morning, uh, Vladimir. To Good morning. Moscow. Uh, Vladimir is a Russian opposition politician, uh, economist and energy expert. He was a deputy minister of energy of Russia in 2002. And he uh, has a weekly a YouTube video at Navalny channel and uh, his latest uh, edition, Why Putin Poisoned Navalny, got almost half a million views. Then uh, here in Berlin, Liana Fix, Program Director for International Affairs at the Korbe Stiftung. Uh, Liana's new book with the title, A New German Power, Germany's Role in European Russia's Policy will be out in spring next year. Yes. And last but not least, uh, Aliona Epifanova, my dear colleague at the Robert Bosch Center for Central and Eastern Europe, Russia and Central Asia at the DGAP. Aliona has been working on Russian domestic politics and German-Russian relations. Check, uh, check out her paper on Russian internet on our webpage, dgap.org. We are recording this uh, discussion and it will be made available later on our webpage. Um, my colleague Marina Sonceva will now share with you some technical details before we start uh, the discussion. Thank you, Milan, and welcome everyone. If you want to, ra and to ask a question, please uh, use the raise your hand button and we will invite you to the podium and you can ask your question uh, with your voice or your video. You may also write uh, your question into the chat and we will pick it up. Or um, if uh, raise the hand button is not working or you cannot find it, just write a plus sign in the chat and we will invite you to speak. Thank you. Very good. And with this, uh, we can start with a brief update on the health condition of Alexei Navalny. Vladimir, do you have you heard something from his family, from his wife? 
Uh, good, good morning, everyone, again. Well, we keep hearing updates all the time, but uh, we have a strict policy at the Navalny team to only uh, comment on the official releases, which are done by the Charité Clinic and uh, Navalny's press secretary, Kira Yarmush. I can only convey a message of hope. Uh, we know that his condition is improving pretty fast, and uh, we hope he'll be back with us uh, the sooner the better. So there is a lot of optimism, but also a lot of caution because the recovery might uh, take quite some time. Uh, he was extremely severely poisoned. That was a very, very uh, severe uh, poisoning with a military-grade chemical weapon, which was, I think, pretty clear from the very beginning. So there is a lot of hope. He's on the road to recovery. And let's wait for the official news. Um, uh, basically, that's the point. Diana, uh, yesterday some new information uh, were published in, in German press, in, especially in the weekly Die Zeit. Could you share with us um, some of those details? Yes, absolutely. Again, also thank you from my side um, for this event. Um, so Die Zeit published an article where for the first time there were more details included on why the German government exactly believes that Moscow is behind the poisoning. And the reasoning, at least quoted in Die Zeit, um, is that a new version of uh, the poison was used, a new deadlier version than was used in the past. And this can only be used by Russian secret services under the instructions for Moscow. And I think that is a pretty significant shift because if you compare it to this Gripal case, we also had in the Navalny case these questions coming up. Why does the German government come to the conclusion that it must have been um, it must have been Moscow and Moscow authorities to Kreml being behind this poisoning. And these are the first details that make clear uh, why they came to this conclusion. It is also important in terms of uh, public uh, opinion and the disinformation campaign that we see at the moment in the context of the Navalny case. And there were many um, uh, lucky coincidences, including the maneuver of the pilot and um, the, the quick um, um, help, the quick, quick medical treatment. Um, but still... Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. That was the conclusion that only for lucky reasons um, Navalny survived uh, the attack. Otherwise, this new version would have been deadlier than, than, than previous versions. And one of the lucky circumstances was exactly that the pilot quickly landed um, the airplane um, and also the doctors um, gave Navalny uh, a counter medicine that uh, helped him uh, survive immediately after the poisoning. Aliona, um, do you have something to add to this? No, I think Liana described it pretty precisely. Um, I just maybe would add very shortly that um, in Russia this year, a very strange coverage of that. I mean, of course, we have a state media uh, who um, mostly report that Russia is ready to investigate the case, but still waiting for documents from Germany. So about the status, uh, health status of Navalny, and that without these documents, they are apparently not able to start the investigation. And uh, there are also some comments by so-called experts that Navalny did not have typical symptoms for such a poisoning and he could be poisoned maybe in Berlin, but not in Russia. So this is the position of the state media. But of course, there are independent media who cover uh, the case um, very closely and also present German position. Uh, and so, so you, you, can, you can get independent information also in Russian. So we wish him speedy recovery. And with this, let's move on to uh, regional elections in Russia. Vladimir, why are they relevant for Russia and specifically for so-called non-systemic Russian opposition? Well, I will come to that in a moment, but let me clarify first about the investigation status in Russia, because uh, all of the instances that Navalny's team had applied for to open a criminal investigation of this attempted murder had blatantly denied so. Last thing was uh, last Friday, Basmanli court had decided that there is no reason to open investigation. We were uh, filing a complaint. I'm against sorry, I think your signal is uh, your signal is not stable. Could you repeat your last sentence, please? Uh, last Friday, Basmanli court in Russia had ruled against uh, the complaint by Navalny's team against the inaction of the investigative committee. The investigative committee does not want to open the investigation, and court it's still. Has, uh, it's still not, at least on my side, on my computer. Still problematic, uh, yeah. Uh, 
So it was okay just minutes ago. No, I, uh, I yeah. guess it's Milan connection. Uh, it okay, so from my side. So maybe I'll continue. So, so point is that investigative committee, prosecutor's office, Basmani court altogether had denied opening any inquiry into attempted murder of Navalny. Uh, our team has filed a complaint, a request exactly on the day of his poisoning, 20th of August, still nothing. The only thing which was done uh, is a, a sort of classified inquiry by the Tomsk Regional Branch of Consumer Protection Service, Rospatrebnadzor which has no investigative powers whatsoever. They're just, I mean, they're, they, are, uh, they, they have the authority to uh, uh, verify how the shops and restaurants are following the consumer protection rules and so on. But this is classified. They do not open uh, the results of what they have uh, investigated. So there's a total denial with all this noise on the, on the Russian side there is a total denial of opening any inquiry, any investigation into the poisoning of Navalny. Now to regional elections. Uh, first, I think they are all very important because they set up the whole uh, nationwide picture before the upcoming federal pro uh, parliamentary elections in 2021, which is going to be the big story because with the plunging Putin's popularity, uh, that might be the first time since 2003 where United Russia Party might lose a majority. Uh, they're actually heading towards that based on all the credible opinion polling. And the so-called non-systemic opposition can make it into the federal parliament. It was absent there for uh, well over 15 years now. Uh, that will be a game changer, a changer of landscape for Putin uh, would severely challenge his credibility as a supreme ruler. You know, you probably saw by this recent uh, constitutional vote that Putin wants to establish a system where it's just him and the people. There are no other institutions which are relevant. Uh, however, if he loses uh, the way I just described at the federal parliamentary elections, the situation will dramatically change. Uh, there will be a parliament which will go against him in many important issues uh, where uh, critical issues which are off the agenda and being silenced will be brought up in the federal uh, corridors of power. He obviously doesn't want that, uh, but uh, uh, the whole background is against him. You mentioned his plunging popularity, but I think it's bigger than that. I strongly advise you to look at the works by uh, Sergei Belanovsky, who is a renowned Russian opinion uh, polling scientist. He was alongside Mikhail Dmitriev, one of the uh, couple of opinion poll researchers who predicted the protests of 2011, 2012. Uh, well ahead before that happened. So recently, Bilanovsky Group had published a number of studies where they actually talk about like total destruction of uh, confidence and support in the authorities in many of the Russian regions, basically throughout the country. I think it's fair to say that Russians have had enough with this COVID crisis. Uh, where uh, Putin actually completely let everybody down. Uh, he didn't release any major aid, financial aid, to help the people, help the economy. We had the, the worst economic downturn in 25 years. Uh, so I think that's the major reason for uh, destruction of his support. And this is why he's fearful of the upcoming federal elections. Right, but regional... those elections, Vladimir, are next, yeah. next year. Um, uh, what's happening in Russia? Uh, on Sunday and before Sunday, regional elections. Uh, regional elections, elections next year? Are, are very important pretext uh, because uh, they essentially, they are uh, the only reliable cross check uh, across the country of how Putin is doing politically. In between this, we have only opinion polls uh, and credibility of opinion polls is obviously questionable because the, the whole environment is not democratic. Now, are they important only as a rehearsal, only for the results or also very important for some regions and for the local races that are taking place there? Uh, th there, is, there is a very significant importance for regions as well, uh, because what, what is happening, and you saw that in the previous years, Putin essentially keeps losing support in one region after another, one by one. Now, uh, one clear example about that is Khabarovsk, where you see mass protests, but these are essentially the outcome of United Russia major losses in elections in Khabarovsk uh, in the past couple of years. 
Now we have you, another. Sorry, let, me, let me cut you there and bring in Aliona with more data on the regional elections. And perhaps if you can share with us some um, top key races, uh, regions or cities to watch. Yeah, actually, this is a very big campaign uh, now in Russia. And uh, Vladimir uh, already said that it's very significant uh, also that so many regions are involved uh, in this process. There are more than 80 regions the election campaign uh, are taking place. Um, and there will be more than 78,000 deputy mandates and positions at different levels which will be elected. So you can imagine like a huge part of Russian citizens are involved in these elections, even if it's like regional or local um, or like, you know, very uh, low level of power. Uh, but still it's very important also to see uh, how many candidates uh, in, in different regions um, are running for different mandates. And uh, I would say like it's difficult to pick like just a few um, examples but i i think uh it's worth watching at novosibirsk uh because um this election campaign uh is special this year uh this there are two elections campaign like in the city council and at the region parliament uh but the most uh, interesting one is the election campaign in the city council because uh we see a strong coalition of uh, oppositional candidates um uh, from different parties, from Yabloko, but also for, from Navalny uh, uh, headquarters uh, in the region, um, from uh, Libertarian Party. So they managed uh, to, to build a coalition and now they are fighting against two big parties, against the United Russia and the communists who are dominate the region now. Um, so the, the coalition has governed mainly around Navalny's headquarters in the region. Uh, and the most interesting thing that the leader uh, who is now like the leading the campaign, he has a very successful YouTube channel um, who uh, took place in the last year's Novosibirsk mayor election uh, with more than 80% of votes. So it, it should be very interesting. There is also uh, a big ambition to to build a coalition in the in the city uh, council, uh, and then also to change uh, the the mayor uh, of the city, who is a, from the communist party. And but but uh, uh, yeah. Vladimir, quick, uh, ju just brief question: What would be a good result for you? We have some major uh, we have some major regions where uh, there are good chances to beat United Russia, particularly in regions like uh, Novosibirsk, Irkutsk, or Arkhangelsk which are also long-standing opposition voting regions, but I think the situation is far worse now. The good result will be United Russia losing the majority in major bodies, so like governor elections in Irkutsk or parliamentary elections in city parliament in Novosibirsk, which is the third biggest city of Russia, and uh, loss, uh, uh, actually runoffs and a second round in, in governor elections in places like Irkutsk and Arkhangelsk will be a success. So I'd say we, we, don't, we don't look at all this picture of, you know, thousands of deputies. We are focusing clearly on some very important regions uh, where United Russia can suffer a defeat and we are putting all our efforts into that. Thank you. Uh, Liana, let me bring you into the discussion and ask you how much is this political dynamics inside Russia uh, present in the in discussions in 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 Berlin or in in German or or European media? How much is it on the radar? Not enough. Um, experts and policymakers who focus on the region they obviously follow the the regional elections closely. But if you look sort of at the general political landscape and also at the media coverage. Um, protests in Moscow usually get more coverage than protests in the regions in Russia. I mean, that might be a positive result of the Navalny case now that the regional elections get more attention because there's interest in the question to what extent is Navalny's um, work and, and, and uh, that he has done followed up in the regions and to what extent has it positive results. So this may be a positive outcome that it gets more attention. And more general, it is also an important reminder that discontent does not have to come from the capital or from, the, from St. Petersburg or from the um, urban um, young people living there, but can also come from very different societal um, uh, corners and also from, uh, from, from far away regions. So I think this is 
um, a positive result of the Navalny case that we pay more attention to the elections. Vladimir, there were news uh, yesterday and a few days before that uh, attacks on uh, Navalny movement activists are continuing. Is there? Uh, could you yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. We, we had an attack because the, the, the major important campaign, Novosibirsk campaign, again, uh, that's the third biggest city in Russia. And this is where opposition has the biggest chances to achieve victories. Uh, some unknown people had attacked their headquarters, why they had like 50 volunteers assembled in there to discuss uh, uh, current campaigning. They uh, threw in some bottle with unknown substance after mm -hmm. which uh, some people fell ill. There was, I mean, no serious conditions, no nothing, and probably it was not life-threatening, but this is just an, another illustration of the intimidation tactics. Right now, I mean, a few hours ago, a head of Navalny team in Chelyabinsk was badly beaten up uh, near his home uh, in there. So yes, I mean, it's like daily news. Also, I have to say, it's not about Navalny team, but there are ongoing police searches in the re uh, offices of Open Russia, Mikhail Khodorkovsky's Open Russia, uh, where, where they are also participating in some regional campaigns. They have candidates in, in elections and so on. So it's uh, on one hand, uh, brutal attacks. On the other hand, police intimidation. We have that all the time. I mean, you don't spend like a couple of hours without news of that sort. Later, during our Q&A part, um, we will also share some data on connection between uh, these regional races and protests that Marina has prepared. Meanwhile, I would encourage our, um, our those who uh, watch us um, to pose the question on, on chat. Uh, let me move on to our, other, to our second topic, which is uh, Navalny's uh, assassination attempt and the international reaction to it. In your opinion, Vladimir, why was there an attempt to take him out uh, right now, the, the timing of it? Was it more related to Russia's regional elections or to protests in Belarus or to something else? I think there's a striking similarity with the murder of Boris Nemtsov in 2015, because this murder was also carried out just a year plus before upcoming federal elections, which where Putin feared opposition might uh, achieve a serious gains. Also, Nimtsov murder had destroyed an attempt to build a successful democratic coalition to challenge him uh, at the parliamentary elections. So that attempt was successful back then. I think he's following the similar pattern. I think Putin is a, a very classical KGB mentality, no man, no problem. He thinks that by removing the leader, uh, he would be, be able to destroy the movement which is out there to seriously challenge him uh, in power. Uh, and I think this, uh, again, uh, which is why I don't think it's really worth separating regional and federal elections because uh, it's all connected, actually, also Putin and his political strategists, they look at all the data they gather through regional elections to prepare to the federal campaign. So do we. Uh, this, is, this is a very important nationwide cross-check of what people think about the, the current situation and Putin himself. So uh, also, uh, there is a very strong possibility that after Sunday, a uh, couple of days down the road, there will be announcement of an early Duma elections, uh, probably even before the end of this year. Let's look into that. But the information mm -hmm. is, is credible, is coming from the state Duma itself. So uh, this is all connected. Uh, and uh, essentially, Putin is heading towards a major political defeat. Uh, his, his response, he wanted to remove a major political opponent who is capable of reaching out to the nation, uh, to uniting many, many people in his campaign and actually achieving some uh, positive results. Liana, uh, meanwhile, German government has demanded um, proper investigation into the, assassina into the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. Will they get it? What do what what does Berlin can realistically achieve with with these kind of um, statements? Yeah, I think the first uh, the first aspect that is quite remarkable is that the tool suddenly the toolbox of German policy towards Russia has widened because for the first time the untouchable the untouchable issue the issue of Nord Stream two has suddenly been brought into the equation and that does not mean that 
not soon to will be suspended or will be cancelled, but it is a significant shift because it is for the first time um, considered to be that it can be used as leverage against Russia and that it could be used as an instrument of German foreign policy. And that has never been the case in the past before. So this shows how, um, how significant the case of Navalny is perceived uh, from the side of the German government. And the question, what can realistically be achieved, is linked to the question, um, uh, what, fu what function do sanctions fulfill, right? I mean, you can have the function that you introduce sanctions to uphold norms, to set red lines and to say norms have been violated. That's what we, why we want to give a sign that those norms, um, uh, that we defend those norms. But then if you go into the question of changing behavior, do sanctions change behavior and would sort of the German government change Russia's behavior with sanctions, with suspending Nord Stream 2, then I think it gets, it gets more difficult. It would definitely show Germany's resolve to be um, tougher uh, towards Russia. And um, I think there was also a question in the chat um, to what extent this is in the, a new low in the German-Russian relationship. I think it definitely is, but it is not a shift. It is a trend that um, has been there for a long time and that just now goes on and on and on, at least since 2014, but also since, 2000, since 2012. So what Germany can achieve is demonstrating that such acts will not uh, pass by unnoticed that norms um, will, be, uh, will, be, will be defended, but to what extent a change in Russia's behavior or even um, uh, an investigation into an open transparent investigation into the case, I think this is pretty much unlikely. Aliona, what was the official reaction uh, in Moscow to um, German demands so far? Well, we hear from the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Russia that um, so this is kind of disinformation campaign against Russia. And that's, um, again, I, I said it in the very beginning, that um, Moscow is still waiting for documents and results of uh, the analysis um, of the health st status of Navalny. And um, yesterday also Lavrov said uh, that Germany is not willing to provide Moscow with such kind of information uh, because in this case, Russia will know which knowledge about chemical uh, like about chemical cyst examination was done by Bundeswehr, and uh, and this is this is knowledge which the Germany uh, does not want uh, Russia to have. Um, so this they presented as kind of this disinformation campaign. They presented also as a try to uh, introduce new sanctions against Russia. So this is this is uh, official position so far. We heard from the uh, uh, Russian MFA and also from their um, um, from Vladi uh, from Peskov, uh, who is the speaker of uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, and again, and also you can read some official position in the state media, which I also present. Vladimir, there is a question in the chat. Um, um, what does Russian civil society and the opposition think about the sanction discussion in Germany? Well, it's too early to say because, uh, you know, with this information waves, they, they reach the general society a bit later after, after something happens in international affairs. But really, I have to say that there is already uh, a widespread awareness uh, that in the international community, in the European politics, in the European media, I think it's for the first time ever when nobody really doubts who is behind this poisoning. Because in the previous uh, poisoning attempts or murders, there was a lot of discussion. Maybe it was Kadyrov or some rogue people from security services, or we don't know who. Right now, I think there's a shift on, on, on blame on Putin uh, didn't come unnoticed. Uh, people in Russia hear it, that the whole world is basically uh, pointing the finger at him as the person who is behind this attack. This is very important because this will have political implications. Uh, Right now, Russian authorities are pretty much cornered in terms of their actions uh, on this uh, grave situation. And uh, yeah, they can raise a lot of noise about this information campaign, but questions keep mounting. And international reaction in this regard is very important. What do you think about um, Nord Stream 2 uh, that could be put on the table or how is this a real uh, pressure and price to pay to 
uh, Kremlin and what beyond Nord Stream 2 could be effective uh, in, in terms of um, measures or sanctions uh, on, on uh, the official uh, Russian government? Look, I think first point is that uh, Putin has been very seriously trying through his agents of influence in the West to actually lift the sanctions regime, which was introduced in 2014, after the Malaysian jet was down by Russians over Donbass. That was his major aim. So I think it, it, it's probably it's good news that this is off the table now. Uh, there will be no lifting of sanctions after what happened. And this is, these sanctions are extremely important. They are essentially preventing Russia from, from borrowing abroad, from bringing investment in, and from a major economic recovery, which Putin had hoped for in the previous years. On the Nord Stream, I think you got to understand that this project is not so important economically because we only lose money, lose a lot of billions for boosting the excess capacity uh, to bypass Ukraine. Uh, however, it is uh, much more important psychologically and geopolitically for Putin because that's the leverage that he always tries to use to show that, look, I can play my game in Europe and Europeans will uh, sort of uh, somehow be forced to get engaged in it and do what, what I say and uh, support projects that I promote, right? So that's a very important symbolic issue, the Nord Stream issues. It, it won't, I mean, if it's stopped or uh, suspended, it won't do like, it won't make much economical difference, but this will make a huge geopolitical difference and will send shock waves, demonstrating that no, Mr. Putin cannot do whatever he wants in Europe. I think Nord Stream is obviously on top of the agenda to show his geopolitical might. And I think this is also a good answer to the question in the chat why the German economic minister said that sanctions actually never change behavior um, over the weekend. That was actually quite a surprising statement. Obviously, as a minister of the economy, he, he has to support Nord Stream 2, but it, it undermines his credibility that the German government has been in a leadership position since uh, the Ukraine conflict, rolling over sanctions every six months um, due to the Ukraine conflict. So. Um, uh, it, it cannot be the case that sanctions never uh, lead to a result in the Ukraine conflict. They also prevented that the conflict uh, expanded further. So here the German government lacks credibility in the argumentation. There are um, more and more questions in the chat. Um, I will read some of them and then open up um, the, the floor for questions and answers. Here. But before I do so, um, to Liana and Aliona, this has been amazing. Uh, two or three weeks uh, in, in Germany on, um, in, in terms of debate on Russia, and also in terms of listening to uh, statements from political parties. Um, how did it look to you? What shifts do you observe in terms of um, um, political parties and public opinion? Diana, maybe start with, you, start with you. Germany is also not only in holding a presidency of the EU, but also is uh, preparing for federal elections next year where the, the issue of approach to Russia, what, what Russland politics should be uh, prepared for the next federal government is on the table. Yeah, I will say a few things and I don't know, you, you may want to add that. I mean, I think it's interesting that the CDU is, is divided in their response. I mean, there have been very prominent voices like Norbert Röttgen, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, who um, advocates for a stop of Nord Stream 2 and he's also um, the, the candidate uh, or he's a can, uh, candidate for the chairmanship of the CDU and also for, for the chancellorship. Um, then there are other voices in the CDU which say we should stick to, to Nord Stream 2. I think what is most interesting is the position within the SPD because Nord Stream 2 was obviously um, an, an, a social democratic project from the beginning. Um, and it is also difficult for the Social Democrats because for the election campaign in 2021, um, Russia is always a very um, convenient topic to bring up the legacy of Eastern policy, of Willy Brandt, of um, peaceful relations uh, with Russia. And this case makes it much more difficult to bring up this legacy. 
and to continue to argue um, for Nord Stream 2 and to continue to argue that energy relations keep German-Russian relations um, stable in the long term. That is sort of the lesson from, from the Soviet Union that is mentioned again and again. And it is interesting that the German foreign minister is taking a different position um, compared to other parts of the Social Democratic Party, that he seems to be um, much more open towards um, uh, the case of Nord Stream 2, suspending it. Um, the question then is how much power he has within the Social Democratic Party in comparison to the faction in the German parliament. Aliona, very briefly. Yeah, very briefly. I would say, uh, in general, um, I, I, um, there is more or less a similar partners among parties in their reaction to a conflict with Russia. I mean, we see from one side uh, very strong critics from the Green Party, uh, so who is very demanding now to introduce sanctions and uh, to stop uh, the Nord Stream 2. And on the other side, we have the Linke, so the left uh, wing party which is very reluctant with condemning Russia and rather looking for another way uh, how to, to get out of the situation. So this is a very short response also to, um, to Vladimir, uh, maybe that it's not everybody who has no, um, no doubt uh, who is behind. So there are different uh, options which uh, the link uh, presents now. So um, that's it's not obvious that the Kremlin is behind the situation. And also when it comes to East Germans, I think that is also important to remember that there's a divide within Germany when it comes to the question whether uh, one should ease sanctions. Much, um, many East Germans are in favor of easing sanctions, so there's a clear divide between East and West Germany. That's also important to keep in mind for the election. There are several comments in, in, in chat on, on this part of your discussion, including uh, watch out to Rolf Mützenich uh, on, on Nord Stream and SPD position. Rolf Mützenich is the head of the parliamentary uh, fraction in Bundestag. But let me open uh, now uh, the floor to um, questions. Uh, from the audience. Uh, Marina will, uh, is, is prepared with her data on protests and regional elections in, in, in Russia, but before she prepares her, her um, I think, slide, um, let me read out a question uh, to Vladimir from our dear colleague and former boss Stefan Meister, who is now in Tbilisi and who asks, how much opposition movement is weakened without Alexei Navalny ahead of regional and parliamentary elections, and thus poisoning has any effect on the voting behavior of Russians? Uh, listen, I mean, uh, we, we don't see uh, much of the weakening because we were prepared for situations like that. If you observed what we were doing in the previous years, we had long periods without Navalny when he was under, under administrative arrests, like a couple of months he might spend out with very little communication with him. So we are very much prepared for situations like that. So we have strong division of labor, division of responsibilities. We know what to do. And actually, because of high probability of Navalny being arrested again, we have been specifically uh, planning out strategically what to do and how to behave if he's not with us temporarily. So not right now. I mean, uh, we're not only not weakened, but uh, there is a very strong inflow of new support after what happens. We see much more interest, uh, more people are viewing us, more people are registering with the smart voting. It might be damaging strategically further down the road if Navalny is absent for a long time. I think that was the plan. But so far, I think we're coping pretty well. And there is, again, there is, uh, we see signs of increased support in response uh, to what happened from the Russian uh, society. Thank you. So with this, Marina Sonseva, who over to you. You've been looking at protests across Russia since uh, at least beginning of the year. So what do you, what trends do you see there? Thank you, Milan. Uh, you have mentioned uh, Habarov's protest here. Um, and I think this is a very important point to mention here that uh, these protests were caused by the arrest of the governor from the systemic opposition who was elected at the governor elections two years ago. And um, uh, this time, uh, election, government elections are taking place also in the regions with a very high protest potential. For example, in uh, Arhangelsk region, where the um, environmental protests uh, were taking place, and uh, they're having uh, also an, a candidate for the governor from a new Green Party at these elections. Uh, the Nenets Autonomous uh, uh, Okrug uh, was um, uh, the only region in Russia who voted against uh, constitutional changes. And uh, now they are also electing uh, at the head. 
and this is also the, uh, the interesting uh, region to look at. And mostly the uh, protests in Russia were taking place uh, due to the regional agenda. They are very fragmented. And that is why they are posing more threat to the regional authorities uh, than, um, than uh, to, to the Duma elections. And um, uh, Habarovsk region is a single protest. Region is not much of the problem for the state but because uh, the agenda still remains regional and it's possible to have it under media control. But uh, if the Khabarovsk story repeats in uh, other um, regions, it uh, may become uh, a systemic problem uh, uh, for the government. And uh, I would recommend to look closer at these uh, regions during the elections. And it is not excluded that the Khabarovsk story can repeat in other regions. Thank you, Milan. Couple, thank you, Marina. Um, I will read out a couple questions to you, Vladimir, now. Uh, to, to, to what extent can we expect that electoral commissions around the regions will be honest and do not resist pressure from Moscow in cases when candidates of United Russia are behind other, others and uh, the, just the manipulation of votes that we saw last year in Moscow and elsewhere um, was a case, increasing case. Uh, digitalization allows new ways. What, how are you prepared to observe that? Uh, there are increasing difficulties with observing the vote, voting and vote count, but uh, we are coping with it. We are developing countermeasures. And the good news is that in many Russian regions, particularly like uh, Siberia and the Far East, uh, the situation is very uneven across Russia. There are, there are strong regions where there is absolutely no tradition of falsifying elections. Just an example, uh, five years ago, when United Russia lost governor elections in Irkutsk, where they also have uh, gubernatorial elections right now, uh, the incumbent outgoing governor had ordered to stop downloading the data into the federal system, trying to rewrite the protocols. Now, all of the heads of territorial commissions refused to do so, while 80% of them were members of United Russia Party. So in Siberia, they have a totally different culture. There is more or less honest vote counts. There are irregularities, but not to a big extent. So, I mean, we try to use this opportunity whenever it's possible. And uh, not all regions are in the complete darkness in terms of the fairness of vote count. We have a totally different system from Belarus. We do have some ability to control the, the election results. Thank you. This was a question from Tim uh, Beichelt from Viadrina University. And meanwhile, our uh, chat is exploding with questions. Uh, we also have uh, Maris Ginsburg waiting with the live command. Uh, if we are ready for that, Marina, we can bring him in. Otherwise, I will read other questions. Maris, you may ask your question. Before you do so, then uh, I would uh, I would read out Maxim Tradolyubov's question. Hello. Do the U.S. sanction? Oh, oh Boris? I'm, Boris? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm there. Yeah, thank Go you very ahead. much. Ask your question. Yeah, uh, Mr. Amilo, First of all, thank you, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, my name is Boris Ginsburg. Uh, I'm a PhD student uh, in political science. Uh, I would like to I would like to ask you a specific question about the opposition's cohesion after the Navalny attack. Um, if you look at closer at the uh, opposition, uh, non-systemic opposition in Russia, we will see that the opposition is divided into uh, two different camps. One camp consists of people like you, like Ilya Yashin, like Navalny, people who fight from within Russia against the autocratic system. And the other camp is fighting from abroad, uh, like uh, Gary Kasparov, uh, Karamursa, uh, Khodorkovsky. Um, and um, as far as I know, Navalny, you and Yashin very often criticize the second camp for um, fighting from a long distance. Um, right now, Navalny is abroad and um, I would like to ask you, if he will not come back, will it be, can, can we say that this attack also had the, had the, had the goal to delegitimize Navalny as an opposition leader? and to put a wedge between you and Navalny, because you very often criticized the opposition okay. who- Clear question, over to you, Vladimir, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Vladimir, over to you. Uh, listen, I think really, uh, of course, people like to discuss some sort of divisions, but there is only one camp in the opposition in Russia, not two, because uh, the criteria are very simple. Who has a real strong presence in the regions and strong regional network? 
who has the big crowdfunding system which allows opposition to operate and self-finance? Who has the media with millions of subscribers? Uh, now, sorry, only one camp has that, which means that probably something happens with Kasparov and Khodorkovsky, but look, we, are, we don't have much time to follow that because we're busy doing our stuff. And uh, that's very important because uh, we are present right there in the field uh, on the grassroots campaigns uh, with the people so we don't, you, you probably have more time as a political uh, student to observe all these comments in the social media, but we don't, we work, that's it. Aliona, Aliona do you want to come in um, on this question as well? Yeah, maybe very shortly that um, I think maybe we should see it as a chance uh, for um, for positions uh, to consolidate and to look for uh, new tools, how to bring the agenda, how to use maybe the network and the structures that um, Navalny uh, already started to build and was very successful in that. Um, and I think, <clears throat> which is the, the, the message uh, from the uh, poisoning of Navalny is also that everybody could be, you know, could be such a victim. And I think uh, how I observe it, the situation in Russia that um, there are a wish or demand uh, to consolidate uh, forces and especially now for the regional elections. So I hope it will rather lead to more consolidations and more coalitions like in Novosibirsk. That's why I also think it's worth watching how it will continue also beyond the regional elections. We have another uh, prepared uh, question via video. Manuel Ludwig, please come in, uh, start your video if you want to, and unmute yourself if you want to ask the question this, in this function. Otherwise, I will, I will go to a chat and read Maxim Todorubov's question. Uh, to you, Vladimir, uh, do uh, the US sanctions against Nord Stream 2 play any role in the German political, public political debate on that matter? Sorry, so that's for Liana. Are there any other measures apart from scrapping Nord Stream 2 that the German government might take against Moscow? And let me specify here that any sanctions actually would be done on the EU level. So they would have to uh, the big to the foreign ministers. Yeah. 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 And in fact, they discussed here in Berlin just two weeks ago, they discussed the overall strategy of EU uh, to Russia. So this will also change the dynamics of that discussion on top of other other sanctions mechanism in place on Belarus and Turkey. And this fits also to Stefan's question whether scrapping Nord Stream 2 wouldn't be a convenient way of improving relations with the US. Um, asking the, uh, answering the question of Maxim Turulov, uh, I think the US sanctions on Nord Stream 2 played a huge debate in Germany because they did more than anything else um, to bring everyone or to bring many people together uh, in support for Nord Stream 2. I mean, this is a reaction which goes along the line of we can't give in to the Trump administration using this kind of sanctions against friends and thereby undermining the the order and, and the partnership that we have built with the United States. So in terms of German public opinion, the US sanctions were definitely counterproductive. Scrapping Nord Stream 2 would at this moment improve relations with the US. Obviously, it would not solve the problems that we have this, with the United States. I mean, those go beyond Nord Stream 2, as everyone knows. It also relates to, to, to NATO and so on. It would solve the problem with European partners, with Eastern European partners, but it would also create a backlash within Germany because the supporters of Nord Stream 2 would use this argument to say, this was not about Navalny and Russia. This was about um, giving in to Trump's demand and using Navalny and Russia as a, Russia as a pretext to, um, to, to, to follow the United States and to be subservient to the United States. And I think that is a, would be a difficult turn of the uh, public debate and in public opinion if scrapping Nord Stream 2 would be perceived not as a reaction to Russian actions, but as a way to please the United States and uh, President Trump. A quick follow-up question to you, Liana, from Tom Natal from The Economist. As the EU models its response to Navalny's poisoning, to what extent should it consider, uh, consider Moscow's role in propping up the Lukashenko regime in Belarus? Does it make uh, tactical sense to link the two issues in the EU response? 
Yeah, I think it's interesting that Belarus was not that Nord Stream, the Nord Stream two discussions was not from the beginning linked to Belarus and to and to the Navalny case because it would give Germany more leverage. Also, in the case of Belarus, where we really do not have a lot of instruments to do anything, um, and where Russia is very much in, in in charge of the events in Belarus. So I I thought it was surprising that um, uh, Nord Stream two and the whole sanctions debate is only linked to Navalny and not extended to Russia's wider behavior, um, both in Belarus and towards the opposition in its own country. I think it would give it an additional leverage um, for, uh, for the situation in Belarus, if, Belarus, if this is sort of taken in, in the official explanation of, of a sanctions regime. Mm -hmm. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, let me um, uh, try to bring in Manuel Ludwig with his uh, video question again. Yes, He's ready. Hello. Yes, hello to you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Please go ahead. Yes, okay. Uh, my question is uh, if uh, he will ask for political asylum uh, in Germany. Uh, as his return, we see I'm, I'm the chairman of the World Wide Peace Foundation, uh, as uh, very risky and very dangerous uh, in the future. And a lot of people have uh, disappeared uh, through undisclosed car accidents and 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 okay uh, vladimir over to you listen i wouldn't go uh, too much far ahead with predicting what's going to happen but i'm 100 percent convinced that navalny will return to russia no matter of the risks that he's okay. facing listen i'm i'm facing death threats and beating threats last 48 hours on twitter all the time but i'm staying here in moscow and not planning to go anywhere we discussed this many times with Navalny. He knew the risks that he was facing. He stayed here. I'm pretty sure he will come back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we can't hear you, Milan. Sorry. <laughs> there are more questions about the attack on Alexei Navalny himself, or whether Putin could have ordered it himself or competing uh, security services and all these speculations. We could discuss this for many minutes, but we have short time left. Do you want to comment on this uh, in 30 seconds, Vladimir? Yes, there are no competing ser security services in Russia whatsoever. What we have is vertical of, of power, in, uh, which comes down to one man in all the issues of more or less significant relevance. We have it clear and present in all other issues. So why there would be other competing independent services in this particular case? Uh, Aliona? I think there is a question. If there is a, sorry, let me, let me follow up. Uh, rational explanation to why Putin himself allowed transfer of Navalny to Berlin in the phone call, now famous phone call with the Finnish president. Um, that was approached by Chancellor Merkel. Yeah, what can we can do? We can have only some speculations why they did it. So one of the speculations is that <clears throat> so maybe their uh, experts who were who were there at uh, at the hospital in Omsk uh, decided that there is no uh, traces anymore. So there is no uh, <clears throat> nothing from the poisoning anymore. So nobody can trace this case. So that's why they somehow allowed um, to bring Navalny out of the country. We don't know, uh, but somehow there, there was a decision that it's uh, that is secure now to to have him uh, in a German hospital with an independent expertise. Um, so, but we simply don't know. Thank you. I see a hand of Henner Herringhaus. Uh, could you ask the question via video or audio, please, Mr. Herringhaus? Go ahead. Unmute yourself. If not, I can see you, but you are still muted, so we don't hear you. Unfortunately, let me then continue with, with, with some previous questions. On the um, Europe and German relations with Russia, how much low, what low is this? And uh, Liana, what do you expect, um, how this could evolve in the next weeks and months? Uh, I mean, 
as I said before, I think it's interesting that the Navalny case is debated as a shift in Germany's Russia policy because I do not perceive it, I absolutely do not perceive it as a shift, but really as a strengthening of a tendency that has been um, there before. And I think to some extent the Navalny case is sort of, as we would say in German, the last drop that um, led the discontent and the frustration with the Russian side after years that Germany tried to engage Russia. And let's think back to the modernization partnership of 2008, 2010 at the German and European level. Let's think back to the Meseberg initiative in 2010 that Germany started. Then also even after the case of Ukraine, selective engagement. So there were so many attempts from the German side to or, you know, to, to, to continue the dialogue with Russia that these last cases together with the Tiergarten murder and the hacking in the German Bundestag really creates a feeling of, of Berlin being fed up to some extent with uh, Russia's behavior and limiting the room for those who still try to argue for, um, for more understanding towards Russian position, what we call the, the, the Putin or Russia uh, Verstehe, um, understand us in, in, in Germany. So I don't see any room um, for improvement within uh, the next weeks or months. And I think what is interesting is that France now has also changed it, its position. Um, the uh, policy of uh, rapprochement that Macron has pursued, if you want to call it that way, at least sort of the attempt to create um, working groups with Russia um, and to discuss European security that France now also has um, cancelled uh, the latest meetings of these working groups. And this shows that it's not only about German-Russian relations, although Nord Stream 2 is very much a bilateral issue, but this is about a hardening of Europe's position in general. I encourage uh, everybody who's interested and can read German to check out a new policy paper by Stefan Meister that was published on our webpage just yesterday on uh, the need, the call to shift the paradigm of German policy uh, on Russia. And meanwhile, um, Marina, please help me with um, chat questions. There are so many that uh, I'm losing track. I'm, I apologize to um, those who could not make it within the time that we have, and also um, to, a, to a gentleman that tried to get in uh, with video. Over to you, Marina. Um. There is a debate on which level the green light for the poisoning of Alexei Navalny was given uh, necessarily by the Kremlin himself, and there were a lot of questions about it. Maybe you can comment on that. I think we addressed that already. Um, then I would, I, I would just um, um, give you a final 30 seconds um, and to go around, starting, starting with you, Vladimir, before we, we have to close at 11 sharp. Yeah, I think yes, we're looking forward to some major victories in regional elections and a strong, uh, strong campaigning for the upcoming federal elections. Please look into that. But I would still encourage you to discuss the opening of an independent international investigation into attempted murder of Navalny. I know many people uh, are doubting about the possibility, the jurisdiction and so on. But I think it's very important that the truth comes out. And there's a lot of information that can be obtained by German investigators. So I strongly encourage you to do so. Thank you, Ariana. Um, I would say I hope that the, this case will also move more attention or attract more attention of uh, Germans or European politicians uh, towards their uh, domestic dynamics in Russia and also to see the, the bigger picture under this, which conditions um, Navalny was poisoned and what it means uh, for, for the country as a whole. Also in the future, like to see in the um, long-term developments in the country. And 30 seconds for Liana Fix to yeah. close this debate. No, I think it's but the most interesting thing to watch from the German side is how Germany will now try to get out of the trap that it has created for itself with Nord Stream 2 because it was completely predictable that it will come to the point. Um, the question was only, it was only a question of time, um, how far the Nord Stream 2 pipeline will be finished until we have another breaking point in the relationship with Russia. Now this happened shortly before the conclusion um, of Nord Stream 2, the final construction. So um, yeah, getting out of the trap German, the German government created for itself will be interesting to watch. Thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. Best of luck. Also with your video that you will, you will record on Navalny channel after this. Uh, to Liana Fix and uh, Aliona Epifanova, thank you also for all others that uh, have been with us and uh, see you at uh, 
uh, some other uh, online discussions on Russia that we will have. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.